Yeah, my uh, my name's Steve Penrod, and uh, my title at the uh, at Warner Gear at the time of closing was uh, the uh, negotiating committee, bargaining committee for the union. Tell me, Steve, um, when did you start at Borg Warner? What was your first job walking in there? When did I start at Borg Warner? I hired in Warner Gear in uh, July of uh, 1983. Um, I'd have to think back. I'm 47. I think I was right around 21. <laughs> um, my first job uh, in the shop, actually, I was uh, lucky to hire in. I hired in an assembly. And at that time, assembly at Warner Gear was good jobs. Uh, the pay was good, and it was rare that a new man off the street would hire into assembly. But I hired in on the Marine assembly. We did a lot of work for uh, uh, the Marine Industrial, uh, Caterpillar, J.I. Case. And uh, the first day there was scary. You know, I mean, it was a big place. Um, it was big enough where you could get lost in it. You know, I mean, if you didn't, if you didn't have a map. Um, but it was scary the first day. Um, but it didn't take long to fit in. Uh, like I say, I worked on the assembly line. Those, uh, I remember my first supervisor, his name was uh, Harry Huddleston. Uh, Harry was probably in his middle to upper 60s at that time. Um, but I remember Harry having a meeting. There was about, I think, maybe eight or nine of us that hired in on that marine line. And uh, he had a little meeting with us. And uh, one of the first things he said, now he says, I won't tell you guys, he said, you may not like me. And I don't give a goddamn, but if you just do your job and I'll show you how to do it, then you'll get along fine at Warner Gear. So that was my um, first meeting with the supervisor, and it turned out to be just like Harry said. There were some people that didn't like Harry, but as the years went by, I realized that Harry was probably the best supervisor I ever had. You know, he showed you the right way to do it, and um, you either picked up on it or you didn't. But on the other hand, he wasn't the most pleasant fellow to be around sometimes. But after you got to know him, it was just his character. So really, uh, my supervisor <clears throat> helped me feel um, at ease. You know, it was good. I liked that, that he was right up front. And uh, so that kind of knocked the edge off that, that first day at, at Warner Gear. So. <laughs> Tell me uh, a little bit about, uh, you mentioned that your father worked at GM and you had other family working in different factories. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, this was kind of uh, continuing on and family kind of work in a way. And, uh, tell me a little bit about how that was and how it felt. Yeah, uh, to about a little bit about like my family and how we were connected to the auto industry. Um, this morning I tried to write some names down. Uh, and I'm sure that I've missed somebody, but you know, as I write them down and look at them and, and, and think about, you know, uh, what the auto industry's done for my family as far as uh, the way it's provided. Uh, as an example, my dad, he worked for General Motors right here in Muncie. Um, and then I worked uh, at Borg Warner. Uh, my dad's brother, Bob, he worked for General Motors here in Muncie. Um, he has two boys. One of them works for, started working for General Motors here in Muncie, and he was, uh, had to move a couple different times, you know, to maintain his, uh, his job with GM. Uh, I think Greg uh, started out in Muncie, and I think he went to Oklahoma for a while, then he ended up at the new Saturn plant down in Tennessee. Um, and my brother's, uh, or my uncle's other boy, Tony, he works for Chrysler. Um, and my dad's dad, he worked at Warner Gear. Um, and my father, or my, uh, uh, my grandmother's father, which was my great-grandfather, he had two sons along with himself worked at Warner Gear. That was three out of that immediate family. And I like to talk about him a little bit. Uh, my great-grandfather, one of his sons that worked there because I have one of his pay steps. And I think it was from 1940. Uh, I think he made $28 and some odd cents for 40 hours. So I like to go back and reflect on that, you know, 
sometimes, and I have a copy of that contract uh, from the 1939 uh, contract. Um, but you know, that was on my dad's side, uh, coming down on my mom's side. Her dad worked for General Motors here in Muncie, Indiana. Um, she had a stepdad. He worked for Chrysler uh, in Newcastle. And uh, my mom had a brother, Bill, who uh, also worked at Warner Gear um, here in Muncie. And um, my mom had a couple sisters. Uh, my Aunt Marilyn, her husband, uh, we call Uncle Larry. He worked for Guide Lamp and Anderson. And uh, my mom's uh, other sister, Caroline McCollum, uh, her husband, Uncle John, he worked at Warner Gear. His big brother, Bill McCollum, worked at Warner Gear. And then there was uh, two children uh, that worked at Warner Gear with me, Rick McCollum. Uh, I think Rick was a 73 seniority guy, uh, hired in 1973. And uh, his younger brother, which is my age, John, he hired in with me in 1983. Um, and then down to my father-in-law. My father-in-law worked at Warner Gear. He had two brothers that worked at Warner Gear, and his son works at Warner Gear. So, I mean, that's what I consider to be my immediate family. Uh, and hopefully I didn't leave anyone out. I feel like I probably did, but, uh, but they've, they've done a lot for us, the auto industry. It's meant a lot to my family. Uh, from you know as far back as, as I can as I can remember um, it's meant a great deal to my entire family um, so we've always been thankful of that and like I say hopefully I didn't leave somebody out I was going to have my daughters look at that later and, and see if I had was getting everybody because there were so many of them but uh, the auto industry and the UAW has uh, provided uh, for my family for uh, for many many years and branching out you know uh, quite quite a ways so we're definitely thankful for that at that time how do you think having that kind of a lineage connected to Ford warner and the auto industry how do you think that i mean i've heard guys say that back in the day in the contract it was written in there that you know you could uh, family members got first rights to get in there and get jobs and that kind of support system it must have had even before you were of age to work in there, you must have had some sort of feelings that this is my future coming up. Yeah, uh, I mean, how did I feel about it? I mean, the auto factories, when I was growing up, that's what I had in my mind, that I could probably work at General Motors, which was Chevrolet, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, on 8th Street in Muncie, or Delco Battery, which is where my father worked, or Warner Gear. Those were, you know, all the, a lot of the young kids, um, as I was growing up, I mean, the older ones, like, you know, that was 18, 19, 20, those were the jobs <clears throat> that they sought after. And at that time, there, were, there was, you know, plenty of, uh, of them jobs like that. Um, but it's... Um, it's changing. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's changing, you know. But uh, those are, that's what I looked at when I grew up. I never really thought about college. I thought that I would just work in the auto factories uh, around here, and that's what most kids, I think, hope for that didn't go to college uh, to land uh, the big job, you know, in the auto factories. Kind of along that same uh, tone, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, when you were a young kid growing up in this family of auto workers in like I mentioned to you, I remember growing up in it and going to the Christmas parties and picnics. And you had this kind of extended family, yet it was still uh, very kind of cut off from the rest of the world. You know, you didn't seem to associate. I know I didn't. I, a lot of my friends were guys my dads worked with their kids. So maybe tell me a little bit about that growing up. Yeah, growing up in the uh, in the auto. Um, uh, in a family or a uh, community where the, the auto uh, industry was uh, really the main uh, supplier of, of jobs, uh, for lack of better terms. For me, it was, I'm not sure about some of my cousins and, and the branched out relatives. For me, 
the union was uh, the activities were to a minimum uh, my dad was extremely active in the union and he liked to keep that separate from the home but there was still the the uh, the upbringing of the union and what the union was and, and we had discussed it many times but uh, we didn't uh, we wasn't involved as a f immediate family with my dad uh, in a lot of union activities. Uh, my parents were separated for a few years and I lived in Florida for a few years. But even um, there, before and after, there still just, there wasn't a lot of activity uh, with my dad in the union um, as far as the family went. We didn't attend a lot of picnics, although I do believe that my other relatives and stuff did. Uh, but it, it was a major um, topic of discussion growing up. Uh, I mean, like for me, I can remember um, conversations about um, from my dad just at the dinner table about uh, social issues and what the union was doing with the social issues at hand, whether they be uh, civil rights issues uh, or health care issues. Um, and I can remember my dad always reminding me that, you know, that the union is feeding us right now. <laughs> and as I look back, the union has fed me up until April um, of this year, 2009, the middle of April. The auto industry and mainly and most, uh, most of all, the UAW has provided for me my entire life. Well, I'm 47. And so they have provided for me my entire life. And... Uh, as like I say, as I look back to the activities, I'm not sure why the activities for my dad was kept to a minimum, uh, but I do know that he was extremely active. Uh, he got a, 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 a uh, he got an award when Delco Battery shut down. He's deceased at this time, and he was deceased when Delco shut down. He got a uh, distinguished uh, honor uh, award from the UAW. Uh, for his work that he had done down through the years. He was on, actually, Dad was on the bargaining committee when the UAW established the 30-year um, uh, pension uh, plan. So, uh, but I think because sometimes that my dad was so active in the union that, uh, that he, he enjoyed his family life and, and tried to keep it separate. Not all guys are like that, uh, but for me there wasn't we just wasn't involved in a lot of union things although i clearly remember that's the most that i remember from my dad growing up is his activity in the union and and our discussions about the union uh, so i owe my uh, union education i like to say to my dad uh, he was always straightforward about it and he used to always say i think his um the the quote that I remember best from my father was that there was two kinds of union people. One guy that had his hand out and another guy that was willing to do something for the union. He always told me what you need to understand about the union is that you don't hold your hand out. The union's already done for you. And I really remember this when I hired in Warner Gear. He reminded me that it's your turn now to give something back to the union and and that's how the union functions and that's how it survives so don't go there with your hand out you know don't think that you have this union job and and they're going to carry you you carry them and that was my inspiration to get get started um, actively in the union i had only been there i think two years when i got my first job uh, in the union and uh, but Back to growing up, my father, we really kept that, the activities as a family, to a minimum in the union. You know, I couldn't be sure why, but I know a lot of it was because my dad was so active and he wanted to keep some separation there at home. My mom may have had something to do with that. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, it was definitely something that was always in the forefront. And um, even on, uh, like on my dad's tombstone there is a UAW emblem. So, you know, he, that's, that's all he knew was the UAW life. So and I, uh, that's something I'll always value uh, what he gave to me in, in the union perspective, you know, as far as what it is 
and you know don't make any bones about it they don't owe you nothing that's what he used to say so don't don't go in there with your hand out so and uh, that's something that I still carry today you know I join the union again tomorrow there was a chance <laughs> um, do you think that maybe um, with your uh, two daughters you kind of did you have them maybe more involved and, uh, no know? not really uh, to bring my daughters involved in the union uh, uh, no um, I was active in the union at an early age. Uh, like I said, I had been at Warnegar about two years uh, when I took my first union job. Uh, but no, I kept I kept that away from my family too. Um, the involvement, although they do remember going to a few picnics, I did take them to several picnics. Um, but that's something that I kept away from the family too. Uh, when the girls were young, me and my wife had, had divorced. So that, for me, helped. I don't know if it was consciously or not, but it helped keep my work life separate from the girls and, you know, try to be a full-time dad. And, and they lived close by, so I was able to do that. But they know all about the union. I raised them the same way my father raised me, you know, that... Uh, to understand what the union is and let them know this is why we have the things that we have. We were thankful that Borg Warner as a company was here to provide a job and we were most thankful for the union to make sure that things were good and fair. So my daughters clearly understand what the union's about and how they function. Um, and I've tried to make them understand that they're like any other organization. I mean, they're not perfect. <laughs> There's all kinds of things wrong. But that's just the way it is, and you work to make those things better. But they understand that, that in the work life that you're on your own. If you have a union, then you have someone that can look out for you a little bit. And um, so I've, I've showed them like the professional sports players. You're either on your own, you have an agent or a lawyer, or you're in the union. It's, it's brutal out there. It's just life isn't fair. That's just the way it is. <laughs> so the union, I wanted them to know what it was and that it definitely had its pros and cons. But fundamentally, and the philosophy and the ideology of the union was a good thing and they've provided for us. So there's really no complaints other than to try to strive and make things better. But it was important that they understood that I was active in the union. Um, and they understood um, some of the issues, as an example, the 89 strike. So the, my daughters growing up, I kept them away from the union, but I educated them at the same time about why it was there and what it's doing for us and, and how it's provided for them down to the years. So they have a clear understanding of that, and they are union supporters. <laughs> what um, kind of wrapping up this kind of topic here a little bit what do you think is maybe one of the most important things with unions or some uh, the most important thing that's being lost with the eroding of unions because you know, the story kind of I mentioned to you before is this loss of culture and it's also you know what unions provide for people yeah what's lost in culture uh, with the unions uh, disappearing or dwindling to smaller numbers what you have is you have, we're just going back in time, uh, in the workplace, it's just, it's just the way it is that things, there's deadlines to meet and quotas and schedules. And there has to be, in my mind, there has to be a union in place in, in uh, uh, the social environment as well as the work environment to help keep things fair. I don't, uh, it doesn't mean every company is bad uh, or, um, but in my mind, the union has to be there to help point out the, the changes that we need. And I've always looked at the union as maybe not necessarily uh, solely on these work issues, but as, as time has always went by in this country, somebody has to stand up for the issues, whether it be uh, the battle and the fight for taxes, or for uh, voting rights, uh, or human rights. 
so to me it's important that the union ideology is kept up there in the forefront of our social and work environment as someone who stands up and speaks for things that need the, the working class people and the people maybe who can't speak for themselves need to survive in, in this uh, ever-changing social and uh, economical uh, uh, environment that, that we're in. So it's, I mean, so the changes will be, uh, I we, we used to always get irritated for uh, like uh, the state of Indiana. Uh, our our uh, labor laws in my mind are laxed. Uh, as an example, there is no uh, hour limit for a, a guy to work. If the company wants you to work, I think they can work you up to 16 hours. Thank God they don't go over the 16 mark. But on the hours of work, as an example, I mean, if you was to walk in a machine shop and they're saying, you know, we work 12 hours a day, six days a week, you want that job or not? On the other hand, when you get home at night, you could turn on the TV and only as an example, seeing President Bush speaking about the social issues in poor communities, that the parents need to be home. How in the hell can they be home? They got to work. You don't, you don't have any limit. There was a factory here in town that that's, that was the job. They worked. Their contract was 12 hours a day, four days a week, unless the company wanted or needed more. So it's hard to balance that work life with some of the injustices that might be there or uh, the limitations of the workers' rights and your home life. So I was always amazed at that, uh, to see someone preach about the parents need to be home, that in the real world, they can't be home. So in the absence of the union, that's what you have. You just show up for work and you'll work however they want you to work and as much as you, they want you, or you don't work here. Now, is that's, you know, I mean, that's the way it is. So when the unions are gone, or uh, to a limited, that they're a limited resource, then that's what you have. You're on your own. It's like any other issue. I mean, you either have someone there to help you, help you along. And in my mind, I mean, that, that's what life is about. I mean, to reach back and help somebody along. I mean, that's the way I was raised, whether it be the union or the church, or the Boy Scouts, um, just as a couple examples. Those, uh, that's how I look at the union. They're as, just as important as any other uh, organization in my mind. So. We'll kind of move into uh, classes. You mind taking no, classes? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just keep them up for the rest of the time. Kind of the way the, the lights yeah. really glaring on them. Um, We'll kind of move into, I guess, factory, the factory itself and some dates and stuff here. Um, tell me about um, maybe the, was the 89 the first strike you were in on? Or do you remember yes. the first strike? Yeah. Uh, to remember the first strike um, that I was involved in, and we only had one strike at, at my uh, time at Warner Gear, it was in 1989. Um, it, so it was my first experience on the picket line. Um, it was uh, enlightening <laughs> and scary, at, you know, at, at the same time. But again, it was it was the reality of it. Again, uh, the issues at Warner Gear, to my recollection, uh, the main issues was uh, health care uh, and the retirees, uh, which is still issues up until the day they shut the doors. But the 89, the 1989 strike at Borg Warner uh, here in Muncie, Indiana was, um, it was also an eye opener to me that the unions were in danger. There was a lot of community support, a lot of community support from, from Muncie and the surrounding areas. But there was also some, some, uh, I don't know if it was animosity or, or a lot that wasn't sympathetic uh, to the situation. Um, did we gain anything as a union? I'm not sure that we did other than uh, principal issues. We did salvage uh, at that time uh, our issues of health care. But uh, it was a brutal reminder that uh, 
the, the going on strike is uh, extremely dangerous for the union. Uh, and it's bad for the company at this time. Uh, it's not like it was 20 years ago. It's hard to uh, be on strike um, in today's, even in 1989, it's hard to be on strike. I mean, people need to work. And, uh, but, you know, again, people listen to the leadership of the union at crunch time, and, and it, was, it was best in the union's eyes that we went on strike uh, to uh, maintain the level of health care benefits that we had. And um, it worked out uh, on the issue of the health care, but I'm not, uh, I think it left an everlasting scar on local 287 in Boer Warner. I think that was uh, the first strike they had had in quite some time. And uh, I think it left a scar. Uh, how long was the strike? The strike was about six or eight weeks. It was relatively short, but the guys on the picket line, I mean, it seemed like an awful long time to me. Um, but uh, it was an eye opener uh, to, uh, to the picket line, you know. I can't say it was fun. I tried to find, you know, something uh, humorous in our daily activities, but I can't say it was fun. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I enjoyed myself on the picket line, but I was making the best of a bad situation. Uh, so it was, uh, and my dad offered a lot of insight uh, for the picket line. Um, so it was something, it was a good experience. I mean, as, as hindsight, I'm glad that we went on strike for my education to understand and be there and, and to see exactly what goes on on the picket line and why it goes on. I mean, strikers don't just bust windows because that's what they do. There's the emotions are running high, extremely high. So, uh, in retrospect, I'm glad that, that we've done it for my education. It, it helped me in life understand that, that what goes on on the picket line and why it goes on. No, well, it's not always pretty. <laughs> Something that the union felt like they had to do. Um, we're talking a little bit about working in the shop and stuff like that. What do you think, because um, you guys were a closed shop, right? Yeah. Tell me maybe a little bit about, you know, the benefits and um, whether it be wages or um, medical or whatever, just some of the, the good stuff about what people don't understand what a closed shop is and what that provides for you. S some of the good things about working in a closed shop in the union where you had to belong uh, to the union to work in there. The benefits of uh, our everyday job uh, the benefits that we reap from the union was that, as an example, I worked in an area where there was, uh, I think there was, uh, when I first hired in, there was 15 of us that hired in on this uh, marine line. And what the, uh, the union rep told us when we hired in, <clears throat> after the company had assigned us a job, if there was another job that come open for various reasons, whether a guy retired or moved to another department, we were allowed by seniority, meaning the date that you hired in, we could bid on that job. So us 15 people, when we had a job open, what we done was we went down our seniority list based on the date you hired in to see that's how we chose who wanted that job, as long as you could do it. So in my mind, that was a good thing, and I had seen the union administer that, make that happen. That wasn't in our contract, but we could make that happen on the shop floor, and the supervisors would go along with that. So to me, that was one of the benefits that I could move around. I had a way of moving around uh, and had some say in whether I'd like to have that job or not, versus the supervisor just saying, this is your job, Steve, and tomorrow I'm going to move you over here or I'm going to move you over there. If it wasn't on a need-be basis, you're always being moved on a need-be basis, but if it wasn't on a need-be basis, the union provided us with some choices and some say in like that as an example of that job, so which was a good thing. I had moved from job to job many times based on that. And to, to my uh, 
understanding. The union had facilitated that in the very beginning. Um, and that was one of the benefits of having a union in our everyday job. Uh, if you had a complaint um, or problem with your job or with your supervisor, another benefit of the union was that we had someone working on the floor, which for myself, I had that job for many years. So you had someone there to help you. The supervisor just wasn't going to accuse you of something uh, without establishing the facts. So for me, the benefit of the union on my everyday job, uh, and you know, and that's putting with the wages and, and, and insurance benefits aside, the union was there. I benefited from uh, safety guidelines like OSHA to make sure that the, we were following OSHA standards. Uh, so that was a benefit of the union. Uh, and for me to uh, disagree with the company or, or raise objection to uh, uh, something that was going on, that benefit was provided to me from the union. I was able to speak up and, and have some say on, on my everyday job about you know what went on every day uh, to a certain extent. Uh, so you know that was one of the benefits of having the union. Uh, there on the floor and there was many times that that um, it worked for me the way I wanted it to and there was many times it did not work for me that was the uh, the harder part of the, the union reps job on the floor was to let some guy know when when you're wrong you just need to go back to work that was the tough part and and not everyone has that in them so but that was one of the benefits of, of the union was that you had say on your job you know, uh, which is which is a great thing because I've worked places where you didn't have any say. <laughs> so you know, to have the union right there on the floor, to me it meant everything. I felt like when I went to work every day that I would be treated fairly. So with that, you know, that that was good enough that, to know that I was going to be treated fairly um, because the union was right there. So that was a good thing. We're about halfway done. Do you want to take a break? Yeah, that's fine. We take. Okay. Yeah. Sent him a donation the other night and picked up two uh, Tommy Emanuel tickets that's coming to Ball State there in October. Oh, really? Yeah, the guitar player. I need to send in a donation as much as I watch that. I feel guilty for not sending them money. <laughs> it's just the way it is. I mean, their money goes back home. You know, I've. We don't even build. Uh, I mean, I still. Uh, now that I'm unemployed, I mean, I'll always drive a Ford or GM or. You know, I mean, that's what provided for my family. So I think the girls have got that concept, yeah. you know, that uh, uh, I look at it like, I mean, I, I've tried to tell them, I mean, you know, why would you help the kids in the other community for, first? You know, there's little kids just right down the road here that need some help. So we'll help them first. And that's, I mean, it's not the, that's to me, it's, uh, you know, it's a simplified math. It's not algebra. I mean, if you don't, you know, buy American goods, the money doesn't trickle down as much. So, to me, it's, it boils down. I mean, because I I heard your argument. Well, there's plenty of Honda plants and Toyota plants in America and stuff like that. And they said, they said, well, they're built here. And then you also have foreign parts and American cars nowadays. It's all mixed together. And, I'm, and to me, it's really boiled down to. You're either buying union goods or you're buying non-union goods. And the union, non-union goods, if it's Toyota or Honda, it was, it was built in America here. You're paying lower wages, lower standards, and stuff like that that these people are working in these factories, just like the work that went down to Seneca. Exactly. You know, and that's kind of what it's boiled down to me as far as that argument when people say, well, what's the difference anymore? This Toyota was made in South Carolina or Ohio. Some places don't have an a example they can use as a difference. But what the difference is right now, uh, I think one of the differences that's facing the big three is their legacy cost. If they don't survive, they got too many people retired. I mean, in that respect, Toyota they don't have that. You know what I mean? They don't have that. So that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So you know it's. Um, um, and for me, I've always looked at it like this too on the trade. Whether you like it or not, this is the global marketplace. This is where we all meet right here. I'm not so sure that that's the best, but it doesn't matter. This is where everyone meets to trade their goods. The pilgrims must have started that shit. But so it's the way it is. 
Now, in my mind, the only thing that I ask for or would expect from this being a global marketplace is that whoever comes here, Toyota as example, or Nike tennis shoes, the how you built that product, how you made that product was under the same circumstances that Borg Warner had to work under. You should have environmental laws, you should have child labor laws, you should have safety laws and everything else. And for many, many years, and I'm sure today, it's still not up to our standard. It wasn't that way. So you don't have fair trade. I mean, I always got tickled even when Borg Warner approached us about being more competitive. You mean just that, that very short sentence. You mean trying to be more competitive. You can't compete and survive. So your talk should be about how long will we last? How long can we survive as an American-made company? You know, uh, when we're, it doesn't matter if it's a union or not. How long can I make tennis shoes compared to Nike? So in this global marketplace, I don't like it, but I accept it as long as that we're all on the same playing field and, and that's not happening you know and that's <laughs> so the idea of this global marketplace is uh, is uh, the outcome is kind of goofy <laughs> let's talk um, we talked about the 8-9 strike let's uh, move up a little bit to one of the other things that I've kind of heard a few times and was listed in the history it was in 1991 the manual transmission line was taken out of there I can't remember if that was for the marine line or what it was, but that was a big, moving that line out of there was a pretty big. Yes, in the early 1990s, I don't know if it was 90 or 91, Borg Warner uh, had removed, was sold off, let me say, they sold off their manual transmission business, which also included the marine industrial. Uh, there was specifically uh, there was a company Tremac that was involved I think there were several companies involved and a lot of chaos as far as information that the worker got but nonetheless when Borg Warner unloaded um, their manual transmission business I think we lost uh, probably being conservative six or seven hundred jobs uh, at that time uh, which was uh, a disaster, you know, I mean, <laughs> a real disaster. And I probably personally knew maybe 20 people, uh, you know, on a, a real close basis. And I think that there was two of them who rebounded to that same lifestyle, you know, and same income. I think there was two that I could identify. Uh, one was a young lady who uh, went into nursing um, and got her nurse's uh, license and, and one was a gentleman uh, Monty Walker who uh, had lost his job when we lost the manual transmission business but he went to school under the TAA or TRA whatever they had at the time and uh, got his journeyman's card and he rehired back in as a, as a pipe fitter so those were the only two guys that I knew that that in that sense was able to to maintain that um, uh, same standard of living in that job uh, but when we lost that manual transmission business it had a it had a big impact on Warner gear and it made you think at that time that they might be in trouble if they don't add another product because I mean things are always changing and the, uh, the transfer cases that we were making for four-wheel drives that particular product and the way it was being uh, uh, engineered and made it wasn't gonna last forever so when they lost the manual transmission business, uh, when, any, when the factory went down to one product, it was um, uh, it made you think then that if they don't bring in another product, that, that things could be shaky down the road. Well, it, because of the product we was making, I didn't think it would last. I don't think there was many people out there that thought it would last. You know, for a long time, there was just no real. There were several changes in the model, but the basic concept of the transfer case was slowly changing. The evolution of it, you could see it changing. So, uh, But, yeah, the loss of the manual transmission business, and I was always told that it was a, uh, a, um, a big part of the foundation of their profit and solid profit. It wasn't always real high, I don't think, but I believe it, it was steady. 
you know, on it, they could kind of fall back on that when, when chips were down, that that manual transmission, which included the marine and industrial, was something that, you know, helped keep them going. I mean, it was a continuous flow of, of uh, some profit. Uh, but it had a big impact on uh, the community as, as well as the, the local and uh, your thoughts about Warner Gear and what was happening at that time. <laughs> Um, we've got to move into obviously a historic moment here at the 06 vote. This is something I've talked to a few guys and everybody's got different opinions, different stories and uh, I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, the, uh, the union vote from uh, 2006 was, uh, was about, the actual vote was for the membership of the local union. Uh, to give the leadership permission to bargain with the company. They needed permission from the union because it was midterm contract. We were in the middle of our contract and the company had requested a bargaining session that included concessions uh, in order to be more competitive. Uh, the vote was uh, at crunch time there's always, the, I mean, the union is full of politics, just like any other, with any other group. Uh, there's always conflict between uh, uh, members of leadership. The 2006 vote uh, for Local 287 is what uh, finalized the closure of the Muncie plant. I personally believe the plant was closing in the near future. Uh, when I went to that boat, I strongly believed that the plant was closing. But what I did believe is that if the union took concessions, that we could have survived a little bit longer. That's my opinion. And I'm confident that we could have survived longer than this closure of 2008. I was part of the union leadership, but I was not in the bargaining uh, position. Uh, for the bargaining committee, the negotiating committee they're called. I was a strong uh, advocate that the union should sit down with the company. Uh, my beliefs in the union is that that's your job, is to always bargain for, for better working conditions, always, midterm or not. I felt like that's the primary job of the union is to improve the working conditions or sustain what you have. The union leadership at that point in time was split, and I think it was uh, four or five to two that their feelings that the contract should be opened up and discussed. It's my understanding from the International Union that they also felt like, when I've had, I had a chance to work with the recording secretary of the local union here, who was also the recording secretary during that 2006 uh, December vote, the International Union also felt like the union should sit down with the company because they're threatening us with a plant closure and listen to what they got to say. But the majority, which is how the unions ran, on that's the democratic process that the majority rules, the majority of that leadership in the bargaining committee was not in favor of sitting down bargaining over concessions. Uh, they were most likely the worst concessions. They were most likely strictly wages uh, and benefits, health care benefits. I don't think the pensions was an issue, uh, but it's always health care. So health care was a major issue then. But nonetheless, the local leadership by majority vote did not support giving any concessions. And they had convinced the membership of that by virtue of the union meeting, our discussions on it, and it was voted down uh, not to give the union permission to uh, go in on that midterm bargaining. It was an overwhelming no vote because the membership, in my opinion, listened to the leadership, and the majority of the leadership didn't think it was a good idea to go in and sit down. Now, to me, <laughs> we made a mistake. Obviously, hindsight is 2020, but I say we made a mistake as a union because that's our job, is to bargain, and we didn't bargain, and they closed the goddamn plant. 
So, but like I say, I think it's extremely important to realize that my opinion is that they were going to close anyway. It was just prolonging what I thought was the inevitable, you know. Uh, but it, it didn't happen that way. And as the months went by, it, the reality of that starts setting in. It, I forget when the company actually gave the union a letter that, you know, we're going to close the plant. But the reality of it started setting in, and you could see it in, in people's eyes as the following months uh, come and went. But, um, you know, I believe, I always reflect back, and I, I tell the people, the leadership, the, uh, obviously, obviously on the opposition side of, of uh, what to do, I felt like we should definitely have sat down with them. Uh, hands down, we should have been at the table. Um, the previous uh, UAW convention, I think it was in California, uh, but one of the main themes of that was that it's a different world today. It's a different game, and you have to change. You have to change, and you have to adapt to the new situation, or you'll cease to exist. And for Borg Warner and Local 287 here in Muncie, Indiana, our dilemma was health care. And the union was not in the change mode. And it brought it to a head. You know, I hear people say, only as an example, I worked here 30 goddamn years. I deserve that pension or insurance. I earned it. And it shouldn't be taken away. That statement is true and correct in my mind. But there's also another truth to that. But you, as an example, have your 30 years and you earned that health care. Me, on the other hand, have not. I got 25 or 26 years in. Now, the reality of it is, yes, you're right. You earned it. You deserve it. Also, the reality of it for me is, if you don't make a change, I'm not going to have a job. That's the reality of it. So which one is right and which one's wrong? They're both right in my mind. So I reflect back when I criticize the local leadership about what we've done, I go back to the convention and the theme about it's a new game. If you don't change strategies, you'll cease to exist. And I think that's what happened at Warner Gear. Do you think um, kind of the, maybe the mindset they got into was because the company had several times asked you guys to open up contracts before they were up and they thought they were just crying wolf again and they were going to call their bluff this time. The unions uh, thought uh, or concept of the situation the way they looked at it was definitely that this is a company who has cried wolf time and time and time again. The union had taken concessions after concessions over the last several contracts. They made modest gains in different areas, but nonetheless, in the previous contracts, several previous contracts, there's been concessions as well as modest gains. I definitely feel like that the union leadership at that time was that the company had cried wolf too many times. Because I strongly believe that every guy that was on the union leadership, I believe they acted in good faith and they really thought in their heart they were doing the right thing. I don't criticize them for that. I definitely believe that, that, that they thought the company was crying wolf too many times. So I understand why they would not want to hear it. But like I say, I look back to the convention and the theme, one of the themes of the convention. And you can't be, you can't go into something with blinders on. You have to be aware of the entire picture. And the entire picture in the United States in December of 2006 that we had a health care dilemma in this country that has became our nation's number one social issue. And the leadership that we had could not see that. Or, in my opinion, they would have realized the danger that we're in. 
it just wasn't the company crying wolf. And I don't think the company ever said or uh, give any indication that we're doing this because we're going broke. That's the problem. If you didn't understand the very Pacifics, they never said, we're going broke. So, yeah, go ahead and uh, back step a little bit. To... Yeah, the mentality and the thought line or process of the union leadership at that time about the company crying wolf too often and too many, one too many times uh, was, I believe, was definitely their mindset. But the, what I felt like they wasn't seeing was the company did not say we're going out of business because we're broke or we're going to close the Muncie facility. What it was, it's the health care. We're spending too much money on health care. And from their perspective, if you put your, yourself on their side of the table, I understand. You're paying billions, you know, in, for health care. So the company just drew the line in the sand. And what I am critical of the local leadership at that point in time was that you, they were unable to see the whole picture. It wasn't just Muncie, Indiana. It was on the news on every goddamn channel every night about health care affecting somebody somewhere. If it wasn't the teachers, uh, you know, it was the firefighters. If it wasn't the firefighters, it's Chrysler. Everyone had this health care dilemma. And I don't think that our local leadership could see that big picture. They just thought that the company had cried wolf too many times, that they were a profitable company, and they were, and they still are, a profitable company. But they wasn't grasping the mentality that, from the company standpoint, we're spending too much money on health care, and we're going to stop. That was the bottom line. And if you couldn't see that, then you wasn't seeing the big picture. You couldn't have these, I felt like, you know, a lot of people in the union had these blinders on, and it was only Warner Gear, it was only happening right here. And I think that was a big mistake. Big mistake. <laughs> I've heard the contract wasn't due to be up for quite a long time before they wanted it open. Yes, right? the contract wasn't due. As I had said earlier, it was what they call midterm bargaining. The company had requested that the union bargain in the middle of the contract. Um, now the union didn't have to, they had a contract and they turned out not to but if for me and i can only speak for me my philosophy of the union is the way i see it is that's their job when the company asks you to sit down and talk to them you sit down and talk to them i mean but and i always try to say those guys that, that were opposed to sitting down i believe that they believed in their heart they were doing the right thing. Okay. Um, let's kind of move on, kind of present day here. Uh, I know we did a right along with you, but uh, it's been a good couple months now since the factory's been closed. Uh, tell me, you know, your thoughts and feelings about, you know, what this last six months has been like a little bit, coming up to the close. Now you've been off, things have kind of started to sit in a little bit. Let's just kind of talk about the closing. Yeah, how I feel uh, since the closing and leading up to the closing is I haven't, for myself, I haven't changed a lot. Uh, I mean, I don't like change, but I've been forced, you know, as the years go by to accept change as the way of life. Uh, the last few months at Warner Gear, um, it was like a long funeral. Um, I mean, the in January, I think, if I remember right, it was February when the union actually struck a, a closing agreement with the company. That the damage was done. Uh, to me, it was a lot like a funeral. People were just, you know, biding their time, just riding out the, uh, uh, riding out the clock. Um, some people accepted it gracefully. I've tried to accept it gracefully and based solely on the outcome of the union's closing agreement. I walked away um, content. I wasn't happy and I wasn't, you know, completely dissatisfied. Um, but the part that bothers me the most <clears throat> 
losing the job and that level of, uh, of income and uh, to maintain the lifestyle that I had then, <clears throat> what bothers me the most is that after Warner Gear, the opportunities are fewer, very few, to get back in that same uh, wage bracket or, or standard of uh, living way of life. So I've tried to, for myself and only uh, myself, be thankful of what I had prior to the closing and to try and get something positive for the future, uh, for me. Uh, what the part that bothers me, like I say, is the lesser opportunity that is already in place. There is opportunity out there, but I have to do like everyone else is doing now. I have to look at the education situation and see what skills I need to meet the new job market. That's the part that bothers me. I feel like that I'm kind of like, I'm not too old to start over, but I suppose there's some some rebellion sense in me that I'm not wanting to start over. I don't, you know, I'm 47 years old. I spent almost 26 years, 26 years in that uh, plant. So it's uh, that's really my hardest struggle is not so much at the pint closed. It's it's what am I going to do now? The job market is so different uh, today, uh, and the availability of jobs uh, is obviously in our trying economical times right now is difficult. But the hardest part for me is is the change. If I'm making sense there, not not the loss of the job. But the fact that there's going to be a major change that I will most likely not reestablish that same thing. That part I'm come to terms with. Uh, I struggle with it because I've raised my kids. So I was able to raise my children off of uh, that standard of living from that Borg Warner and the UAW provided me. That's the part that keeps me going. So when I look at, you know, really, I just need to, to, for the most part, provide for myself at this time. Uh, you always help your kids no matter what. But uh, the hardest part is the, that transition into the new job place. That's, that's the part that bothers me the most because I've been undecisive on what to do. And uh, that's the part that I don't want to do is to make that change, but uh, change is inevitable uh, and I'm forced into making that decision. So that's the toughest one, you know, and I hope that's making sense about not necessarily losing the job, but the change that I've got to make in order to get back into that workplace. Um, it's just, it's a tough situation, it's very tough emotionally and, and economically, it's hard. <laughs> um, if I could touch just a little bit, just your thoughts and feelings, whatever they are. Um, about that closing contract, because uh, there's a vote on that, I believe, with the benefits and the sale of that, and not everybody gets what they want. <laughs> you know, that's just part of life. That's true. That's true. So, you know, what, what were your thoughts and feelings as, as that was an issue with the closing? My thoughts on the closing agreement between Borg Warner and Local 287, it was. Uh, it's kind of like, in, in some sense, bittersweet. It could be looked at that the employees that were who, el who were eligible to retire but had chosen not to retire, who was still working, they were forced to give up their health care insurance for a financial buyout. When I, so when I say the bittersweet part of that is on the right side, the gentleman had to sell his health care for a financial settlement. The other side of that was to keep that health care, you were headed into serious legal problems with Borg Warner. They had already taken the position uh, in outside activities with retirees that they were making changes to the retirees insurance. So the bittersweet part of it, just looking at the deal and not breaking it down to individuals, you put some in the categories, the 30 year guy that was still working, he did have to sell his healthcare, but was it a bittersweet ending? You were headed for trouble 
the present retirees already in, have legal litigation issues with the company and their health care. So as time goes by, I think it will be construed or looked at as a bittersweet ending for that guy that was 30 plus years and chose to keep working at the time of the closure. So on the closing agreement, the closing agreement, I think, I accept the fact that it was fair based on contract language that they didn't owe me nothing except my pension when I reached Social Security age. So what a guy like myself with 25, 26 years in there come out with was some early pension options, which made my day and a, uh, a small compensation uh, of wages and benefits for the next year after my employment had ended from Warner Gear. So as to what they owed me, they owed me nothing. I think the deal was fair in that respect. It's hard to complain when they don't owe you nothing. Okay. The pension part <clears throat> was my greatest concern. Uh, when they announced the plant closing, my thought went from here I'm 45 or 46 years old. If I'm not going to be able to retire from Borg Warner with a 30 year pension, I've got to wait till I'm 65. That was a long ways out, a long ways out. So that really turned me upside down. But to think then that we could make a deal and get some pension options, an early pension option. Uh, the, it knocked the edge off of it, you know. So when we walked out with the closing agreement that I had uh, three or four different pension options for myself, or I could just sit it out and wait till I'm 65, that's what kept me afloat. You know, it. I knew that I've got my pension coming. It may not, or it's not going to be near as much unless I wait till the end. But that's the way it is. I mean, the sooner you get things, the less it is, as, with, with, as is with this pension options. But that closing agreement, as controversial as it was for some, not for all, I strongly believe and I supported the fact that it benefited, without a doubt, the overwhelming majority of the members. And the, the minority is the ones that I think and I hope that will be a bittersweet ending for them based on the healthcare dilemma with the company. But it was a controversial settlement, uh, but I think it was the best the union could do uh, given the circumstances at the time they made the agreement. And I mean specifically the day that they made the agreement. So it, there's a lot of people out there I've spoken to since we've been out. Some are tickled to death. Some made out extremely well. Not everyone is in the same situation as far as how it ended for them. As an example, you had, uh, there was a few guys that I can think of that were in 60 and 61 years old and had 25, 26, 27 years in the plant. So they were closing in on Social Security, which made them eligible for the Medicare and Medicaid benefits. So for them to sell their health care uh, issues, it come out all right for them. The guy that was uh, eligible to retire, uh, we had a retirement that where you could retire uh, with 85 points, and that was based on your age and your seniority. So if you had a guy that was 60 years old and 25 years seniority, he could retire. Not on the 30-year pension plan, but he could still retire on a pension plan, which had the same insurance as anybody that retired. So that guy, he made out real well. He took the financial buyout for his insurance package and if he just makes it for a year or two then he'll be on the Social Security issue. So those guys they're real happy. I mean it worked out for them okay. The 30-year guy his pension wasn't ever an issue. Uh, he's gonna have some health care dilemmas. The money that he got it could never be enough. It was only to help you know subsidize uh, an insurance program policy for him. The younger guys like myself, uh, which was the vast majority from 26 years down, I think the majority of them, uh, if they, I think the overwhelming majority, I would say they probably thought the deal was fair. It was controversial, but 
like I always tell people, what you have to keep in mind is before you make your decision whether you think it was fair or not, is that they didn't owe you nothing. Buy the contract. And it's always hard in life to establish what's fair. What's fair to you isn't necessarily fair to me. But so that was one thing about working with Local 287 and Board Warner. We had a contract. And what was fair was written down. So we all understood it. And we didn't have nothing wrote down for them closing the plant like that. So what they give me, I look at was fair. Um, there could always been more, you know, I'm not jumping for joy by any means. But when I look at the reality of the facts and what the things that we had to work with, I think it was fair and I walked away content with that closing agreement that the local bargained for. How um, have you held this union position in the closing? How has it, uh, you know, people calling you up, asking me questions maybe, or, you know, the, the support you kind of been responsible for or even just given just because you took the responsibility of that position? My uh, role on the bargaining committee um, in the closing agreement was, um, was intense. Uh, I had, you know, would receive numerous phone calls daily. I mean, just for uh, an information update on the status of the of the uh, agreement uh, and the Pacifics of it, you know, what are we going to get, How, and uh, when will we get it, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was it was tense. I mean, I enjoyed the job. That's the reason I I, I ran for those jobs. I like them jobs. Uh, but it was intense, I mean, because it was extremely, extremely emotional for people. The insurance uh, dilemma that had uh, created this division amongst the employees and the local leadership, um, and the dilemma of losing people losing their jobs, it was extremely intense, uh, the job. I, you know, I would do it all over again. But yes, I'd receive numerous phone calls at home, on my cell phone, and at work. Um, it was, um, I heard they had to bring out, uh, extra security at some of the last union meetings at the hall. There. They brought out, yes, at the last union meeting, there was some extra security brought out. I'm not specifically aware of the reasonings, uh, for that. For myself, I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. There's, you know, it's a very emotional and trying time. Uh, but there was some issues with some of the bargaining, uh, or some of the, I should say, just some of the union reps. I don't know, uh, exactly what the issues was. I think some of them had, uh, had, uh, received, uh, some type of harassing, uh, call or threatening phone call. I never heard any Pacifics, but shit like that happens. I mean, you know, you can't be deterred by, um, you know, I won't say one phone call, but you can't be deterred by by one thing. I mean, it's just the, the issues are that important and they're that emotional that you know you've got to make some some decisions that are not going to be popular with everybody. Um, so, it, but with the extra security, it didn't bother me. The plant had taken extra security precautions. For me, I you know I th it's like safety first. I never object to any, any additional safety measures that didn't bother me. I mean, as an employee for Borg Warner or a union rep, the additional security measures that was taking place for the union at the union meeting or the things that were taking place inside the plant didn't bother me. I thought it was a good, I thought it was a good thing. I mean, the issues were too emotional for people. Uh, yeah, so, but uh, <laughs> why exactly the additional security? I couldn't elaborate on because I wasn't involved in that. Had did I have dissatisfied people? Absolutely. I never had any threatening phone calls or nothing. But most of the people that that I knew that were were uh, dissatisfied, you know, confronted me personally, and, and that's something I can deal with. Um, that's what the union's about: is giving everyone a voice. I don't um, support or. Uh, condone any kind of uh, of uh, threats, uh, whether they be in person or on the phone. I feel like that that's what the union's about. That you have a voice, and I have a voice. We may or may not agree, and if we don't agree, we'll just have to agree to disagree. And okay, um, tell me a little bit then, as we talk about the 
disposing of the local here. You know, they uh, they came down here pretty quickly. Things were turned over. Property was sold. Um, there's some talk about you know how I, the local was the one to pay for that property. As I have heard, I could be wrong. You know, just the feelings about that, the loss of this local, and what that maybe means to the community, and then the process. Some people thought, wow, they didn't expect it to happen that way. You mean the selling of the union home? Yeah. Yeah. On the closing of Local 287 and the Union Hall and its assets, what a lot of people don't understand is that when you joined the UAW, you, you joined a group and you joined, for lack of better terms, a franchise. The Union Hall was only there because of the Union. The union wasn't there, the union hall wouldn't have been there. Some people's union dues went to provide the hall. I don't know if the very big first hall was uh, built by the union or if it was just a building that they had acquired, but in the organization of the UAW, when the union no longer exists, it would be the same as any organization, the things that are left, whether they be uh, structures or finances, goes back to the union. That's how the union survives. I mean, they have to have monies like any other business. That's what they're doing. They're running a business. So there was a lot of, uh, of uh, some employees or members of the union, I should say, felt like that some of the monies that were left over or the union hall itself, the structure, that money should be distributed amongst them. That wasn't, uh, I didn't have anything in those decisions. That wasn't my job. The, uh, the, the decisions about the union hall and its finances were already in writing. And those are things that the executive board would handle from the union. But there was a big misconception about the funds of the union. Personally, I understand that it's this organization that money's there to keep the organization alive, whether it be Local 287 or Local 551 from Ben Sins. It went back into the UAW's overall uh, funds. To me, that, that is the right thing to do. Um, could people use the money? Absolutely, people could use the money. But I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I look at it as just that. The, that stuff the union needs to do their business and um, not everybody's seen it that way but again those things were already set in place I think the um, biggest guidelines that uh, surround the union um, like the laws and, and government regulations is their finances and their elections uh, so those things are tight. The money for that the union has in their position is the um, is extremely tight as far as the way that it can be spent and it has to be accounted for. So I think when the money and it's the union's assets are left with the organization and have these tight light guidelines around them uh, as far as their usage, I think that that's best. I think it helps keep down uh, corruption and riffraff and, and I think the uh, union's uh, assets, uh, including their structure and their monies, uh, should have went back to the UAW. Okay. I just have a couple more questions to kind of wrap this up. Um, how has, I guess, your obviously your routine has changed, but the, uh, the feeling of keeping in touch with these guys who, you know, were your brothers for 20 years, something like that, and small groups uh, I know you play in the band with some of them something like that and how is that maybe important to you to make sure that you know I mean this is part of your life and yeah the people that worked at Warner Gear um, friends that I had developed over the years like I said I worked there 26 years and some were obviously in supervision it, 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 that part of it is is there's not a, a distinction for me whether you was in the union or for the company I mean I treated people as the way they treated me for myself and 
in the 26 years that I worked at Warner Gear and the people that are out there, I met some of the best people I've ever met in my life about Warner Gear. There were, in my mind, there were very few bad apples at Warner Gear. I thought the vast majority of people were great people and probably the vast majority never agreed with me, which was fine, but on a personal basis, I still think the vast majority of people at Warner Gear were damn good people. Uh, there is some folks that I was extremely close with and maintain that relationship with outside the plant. Not, not the majority of them, but there's a few that, that I had really, um, over the years got to know on a personal basis with family and, and stuff like that. So I, I try to make a, uh, a conscious effort to, uh, to keep that communication line open. Whether it just be by the telephone, you know, or uh, several of them, you know, we talked about having lunch after we, once a month or so after uh, the dust settles, so to speak. Uh, but there is definitely people from Warner Gear that I would not want to lose touch with. You know, there's uh, some some great people that I've met uh, that are, you know, uh, just people that you want to, you know, surround yourself with. I mean, if you're looking for friends, that those kinds of people, I met a lot of those people at Warner Gear, I have to say, and there's a lot of good ones out there, you know, and uh, the ones that I got to know on a real personal basis, I, I plan on staying in touch with, whether it be through music uh, or, you know, just to get together and, and shoot the shit a little bit, socialize about old times in the plan. I'm okay with that too, you know, I don't mind reminiscing. But, uh, yeah, I, there's a few of them I definitely, you know, I'm going to make an effort to stay in touch with. It's important. Uh, sometimes friends are hard to come by. You work with these people for 20, 25 years, and it's hard not to become, you know, friends with them uh, to a certain extent, whether you want to or not. But uh, there's definitely a few that I will keep in touch with, you know. It may be once a week, once every couple of weeks, but there's definitely some people there that I would, would uh, hate not to stay in contact with. So. Mm -hmm. Been. Last question I have is kind of uh, touching a little bit on uh, you personally, um, hopes for future, whether it be job or re-education with these funds that you can get, and um, maybe and also kind of your thoughts about there's a uh, wind turbine company moving in here, Bravini. You've probably heard of it. They're going to be making gears, ironically. <laughs> gears for big turbines, you know, and there might be some guys trying to get in there. It's not a union shop, obviously. But uh, what are your thoughts personally as you try and re-enter uh, the work, you know, coming up and maybe getting re-educated and trained or jobs like that that are coming mm -hmm. along? My thoughts on the future and my approach for the future for me is uh, like uh, the company, I think it's Bravini that was bringing the turbine plant. I've had an interview with them and it, it sounded good to me, but it's quite some time down the road. So, you know, I just, I had my interview, I put my application in with them. And it was really at that point that I, when I was, uh, did the interview with Bravini, that I realized the extent of the change in the workplace as far as pre-employment circumstances went. Uh, but for me, there is some trade assistance available through TRA and TAA uh, for people like myself that lost their job uh, in a plant closure. I plan on taking advantage of those benefits as much as I can. I can't say that it will work out for me the same as it will everyone. Everyone will be a little bit different. Um, I'm going into it with a positive attitude, uh, but also realistically trying to understand what I might get, what could I get. When I look at what could I get out of it, at best, it would just be a good leg up. And to just minimize the benefits that are available to me will help me get started for the future. But what will I do? I'm not sure yet. I definitely plan on going back to school to, uh, um, to the adult basic education to bring myself up to speed. Uh, where I could enter into a community college uh, if I chose to, such as Ivy Tech here in Muncie. Um, but I want to remain realistic too to think that, that even with going to school that in this general area that we're in a very trying economic times and there's just not a lot of work around here right now. 
So I just try to stay focused. You know, I want to use the, uh, the TRA and the TAA to my benefit as best I can. And I'm just going to remain hopeful that the future economically will be, will be brighter than what it presently is right now. And then that's really all I can, can do is to utilize the tools that's going to be available f to me for training and to uh, try to keep a positive attitude. I mean, I think that's best. It, it's what's worked for me so far, and hopefully it can continue to work and, you know, hope that there's a, a better future in mind. So regardless, change sometimes is a good thing. As much as people may resist, including myself, I'm not one for change. But I also want to be optimistic to think that, that this, uh, by one door closing at Warner Gear, uh, it could open up another door, you know, and I'm in a few years I may find myself much happier than I was, you know, a few years back working on Warner Gear. So, but that's about it for me. I just try to remain focused on something positive, and in my mind, that's the only way that you keep going, regardless of what your struggles are, whether they be work or relationship. If you can't keep a positive outlook, then you're probably not going to make it one way or the other. So I just try to keep a positive attitude and, and, uh, and the kids keep me going and uh, I'm just going to ride with that. And we're going to keep rolling, but just a different totally subject. Um, I'm just curious, how has, um, I know music's a big part of your life. How has music maybe helped you, uh, you know, through this a little bit and just um, tell me a little bit about how important that music is. Music, <laughs> music for me is, besides my kids, music is life. To me, I mean, I grew up, I like to tell people I grew up with uh, uh, the uh, Led Zeppelin in my older brother's bedroom and Johnny Cash on my dad's living room stereo. My dad was a music connoisseur. To me, music is everything. That is my life whether I'm playing it or listening to it. Um, I love music. I love all forms of music. I won't, doesn't, don't dare put up any walls or barriers for something that I might listen to. It's like reading a book. I suppose if you like to read, I, you don't want to stay on one author. Uh, so music to me is everything. Playing the guitar. I've played the guitar since I've been uh, probably 14, 15 years old. Um, over the last, I had a, a bad relationship uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, nine years ago. And when I look at that and look at the shop, uh, the issues that went on the shop and, and everyday struggles, uh, my guitar for me is like my Xanax. I mean, that's what brings me back to reality. That's what knocks everything else out uh, off to the side. So when I'm, when I'm playing music or involved in music, to me, that's that's the happy part of, of uh, one of the happy parts of life. I think uh, music can strike a chord in everybody over something. I think um, music makes the world go around, and it definitely does for me. I mean, as you've noticed, some items coming in the house. Um, I play music every day. Uh, I watch very little TV. Um, to me, music is everything. I mean, you know, I do it. Uh, I try to play guitar a couple hours a day. Sometimes that's a struggle, but that's my goal, whether it be just a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening, or a little bit late at night. You know, I, I play every day. Uh, it's my way out. You know, when I'm, when I'm playing, it, it's just that. It's just me and, and what I can, uh, the music that I can put out on the guitar. And um, it's, music's everything for me. You know, I, it'd be nice to, uh, uh, to make a living in the music industry, but it's like any other art. I mean, it's usually a starving situation, you know, where you go around hungry. But uh, to me, it's been my pastime. It's been my hobby. It's been my way out. It's been the way to uh, rest at ease when the kids were growing up. It's been a way to unwind in relationship problems. Uh, it's been ways uh, to uh, maintain uh, when uh, my parents uh, uh, passed. So to me, um, music is as much as life as anything. I mean, to me, music is life. I think without music, the, the, it would be a, a very, uh, a very dull and, and could be emotionless um, uh, uh, people or issues. I mean, to me, I just think that music is everything, whether it be to make you happy or make you sad. 
uh, I've not really heard any music that makes me sad. I like sad music, uh, but for some odd reason, it makes me happy. I just, you know, I just love music, and, and for me, music is life. <laughs> Was there anything uh, you wanted to add to the interview that I didn't cover or any opinions on anything? No, I mean, not really, you know. I mean, um, I think, you know, that we've we've covered everything. I mean, if there was any one particular issue that we've left out or something, you know, that I could give you some insight on. But I think you've done a good job covering my story anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>